In almost every public place today, the ears are assailed by the sound of pop music. In shopping malls, public houses, restaurants, hotels and elevators, the ambient sound is not human conversation, but the music disgorged into the air by speakers, usually invisible and inaccessible speakers that cannot be punished for their impertinence. For the most part, however, the prevailing music is of an astounding banality. It is there in order not to be really there. It is a background to the business of consuming things, a surrounding nothingness on which we scribble the graffiti of our desires. The worst forms of this music, sometimes known after the trade name as music, are produced without the intervention of musicians, being put together on a computer from a repertoire of standard effects. The background sounds of modern life are therefore less and less human. Rhythm, which is the sound of life, has been largely replaced by electrical pulses, produced by a machine programmed to repeat itself ad infinitum and to thrust its booming bass notes into the very bones of the victim. A visit to the pub or a meal in a restaurant have lost their residual meaning. These are no longer social events, but experiments in endurance as you shout at each other over the deadly noise. For our ancestors, music was something that you sat down to listen to, or which you made for yourself. It was a ceremonial event in which you participated, either as a passive listener or as an active performer. Either way, you were giving and receiving life, sharing in something of great social significance. With the advent of the gramophone, the radio, and now the iPod, Music is no longer something that you must make for yourself, nor is it something that you sit down to listen to. It follows you about wherever you go, and you switch it on as a background. It is not so much listened to as overheard. The banal melodies and mechanical rhythms, the stock harmonies recycled in song after song, these things signify the eclipse of the musical ear. For many people, music is no longer a language shaped by our deepest feelings, no longer a place of refuge from the tawdriness and distraction of everyday life, no longer an art in which gripping ideas are followed to their distant conclusions. It is simply a carpet of sound designed to bring all thought and feeling down to its own level, lest something serious might be felt or said. Background music is the default position. It is no longer silence to which we return when we cease to speak, but the empty chatter of the music box. Silence must be excluded at all cost, since it awakens you to the emptiness that looms on the edge of modern life, threatening to confront you with the dreadful truth that you have nothing whatever to say. Pop pollution has an effect on musical appreciation comparable to pornography on sex. All that is beautiful, special and full of love is replaced by a grinding mechanism. Just as porn addicts lose the capacity for real sexual love, so do pop addicts lose the capacity for genuine musical experience. Is there a remedy? Yes, I think there is. The addictive ear, dulled by repetition, is shut tight as a clam around its pointless treasures. But you can prize it open with musical instruments. Put a young person in a position to make music and not just to hear it, and immediately the ear begins to recover from its lethargy. By teaching children to play musical instruments, we acquaint them with the roots of music in human life. The next step is to introduce the idea of judgment. The belief that there is a difference between good and bad, meaningful and meaningless, profound and vapid, exciting and banal, this belief was once fundamental to musical education. But it offends against political correctness. Today, there is only my taste and yours. The suggestion that my taste is better than yours is elitist, an offense against equality. But unless we teach children to judge, to discriminate, to recognize the difference between music of lasting value and mere ephemera, we give up on the task of education. Judgment is the precondition of true enjoyment and the prelude to understanding art in all its forms. The good news is that in their hearts people are aware of this. 
All who have had the experience of teaching music appreciation know it to be so. The first step is to introduce the precious commodity of silence so that your students are listening with open ears to the cosmos and are beginning to forget their addictive pleasures. Then you play to them the things that you love. They will be bewildered at first. After all, how can this old geezer sit still for 50 minutes listening to something that hasn't got a beat or a tune? Then you discuss the things that they love. Had they noticed, for example, that Lady Gaga in Poker Face stays for most of the tune on one note? Is that real melody? After a while, they will see that they have in fact been making judgments all along. It is just that they were making the wrong ones. When Metallica appeared at the last Glastonbury Festival, there was a wake-up moment of this kind. The recognition that these guys, unlike so many who had performed there, actually had something to say. Yes, there are distinctions of quality, even in the realm of pop. The next stage is to get the students to perform, to sing in unison and then in parts. Very soon they will understand that music is not a blanket with which to shut out communication, but a form of communication in itself. And gradually they will know the place of this great art form in the world that they have inherited. Our civilization was made by music and the musical tradition that we have inherited is as worthy of praise as all our other achievements in art, science, religion and politics. This musical tradition speaks for itself, but to hear it, you must clear the air of noise. <laughs>